reading from the Acts of the Apostles. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed, You who are Jews, indeed all of you staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to my words. You who are children of Israel, hear these words. Jesus the Nazarene was a man con commended to you by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs, which God worked through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This man delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God, you killed using lawless men to crucify him. But God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death, because it was impossible for him to be held by it. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. With him at my right hand, I shall not be disturbed. Therefore, my heart has been glad, and my tongue has exulted. My flesh, too, will dwell in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. My brothers, one can confidently say to you about the patriarch David that he died and was buried, and his tomb is in our midst to this day. But since he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn an oath to him, that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that neither was he abandoned to the netherworld, nor did his flesh see corruption. God raised this Jesus. Of this we are all witnesses. Exalted at the right hand of God, he poured forth the promise of the Holy Spirit that he received from the Father as you both see and hear. Verbum Domini. Sure. 
show me the path of life, the fullness of joy in your presence, at your right hand, bliss forever. Keep me safe, O oh God, you are my home. day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Dominus Fabiscum. Exil Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteum. Gloria Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went away quickly from the tomb, fearful yet overjoyed, and ran to announce the news to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them on their way and greeted them. They approached, embraced his feet, and did him homage. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had happened. The chief priests assembled with the elders and took counsel. Then they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came by night and stole him while we were asleep. And if this gets to the ears of the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. The soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has circulated among the Jews to the present day. Verbum Domini. A little over a year ago, Father Mark and I and the EWTN crew, there were seven of us all together, had the privilege to go to the Holy Land and record nine programs. Last week they aired the ones that we Father Mark and I, we visited the sites associated with our Lord's Passion. And this week they're airing the program that we produced on the sites associated with his resurrection. And of course, one of those sites that we visited is the Holy Sepulcher, the revered place of the resurrection of our Lord, the tomb where our Lord was laid. And normally, when we were there, there was just a huge line of people wanting to go in there and to make a short visit. It's a very small area. You have to bend down and go down into this tomb, and you get to spend a few moments there and then say, get out. <laughs> There's always somebody there to keep the line moving. But there was a break in the line, and so Bob Blake, who was running the audio for us and myself, we're able to go in there and spend a little time. And after we had been in there and we left, we both said to each other, we just didn't, did not want to leave. There was this holiness, there was this presence that we experienced while we were praying in there, we just wanted to stay there. When you go in there, it's like there's a marble bench and you kneel in front of that bench and that bench is a revered place where Jesus' body was laid. And it was in October of 2016 that there were actually excavations that were done there. 
and they removed that first layer of marble and what they discovered was that there was another layer of marble under that. And there was a crusader cross on that. So that layer of marble was believed to have dated back to the 12th century, the time of the crusaders. And then when they removed that, they found this bedrock, this stone of the, this rock, base rock of the area and it was a bench with a wall. So you have the bench area and then you had the adjoining joined to this, this wall. And then they also discovered a wall on the other side and it had been carved out. It's just a small area carved out of the stone, which was a typical way that the wealthy would have their tombs made. And the bench was a place where you would prepare the body for its burials. Well, we know that when Jesus was brought to the tomb, they had to do it in haste because the Sabbath was drawing near, the daylight was diminishing. And so they quickly had to lay him on the bench where you prepare the bodies, wrap him in the linen shroud, and then they were going to come back after the Sabbath to do the anointings and the cleansings and all of those things that was to take place. And so all of this, and even the Gospels uh, point to the fact that, like yesterday we had John's Gospel, John chapter 20, and we read that Peter and John, they run to the tomb, and John stoops down. He bends over and he looks inside this, this tomb and he sees the linen cloths lying there. And we also read in other places where Mary Magdalene and others that they stooped down to look in. So it was something that you descended into and the archeology span actually confirms that uh, what the gospel accounts relate. And last week there was uh, an announcement by the University of Padua, Professor Julio Fanti has created this three dimensional uh, image statue based computer uh, computer based on the Shroud of Turin, a 3D carbon copy. And it's really a remarkable uh, statue. And here's what the conclusions that he came to if you based our Lord's size, his stature, based on that Shroud of Turin. This was a March 28, 2018 article on this uh, recent uh, presentation that the University of Padua made in Italy. And it said, according to our studies, Jesus was a man of extraordinary beauty. Long-limbed and very robust, he was nearly 5 foot 11 inches tall, whereas the average height at the time was around 5 foot 5 inches. And he had a regal and majestic expression. And looking at the wounds the professor said, I hypothesize that there was a total of at least 600 blows. And that his right shoulder was dis dislocated so seriously as to injure the nerves. Now none of this definitively proves what we believe and what we celebrate during this octave of Easter. But the church speaks about in our faith in God, our faith in the resurrection of converging and convincing arguments. So our faith didn't take place in a vacuum. It's not just some dream or fantasy that we have, but it's something where even archeological evidence points to it, as well as historical evidence, written evidence. All of these things, our faith doesn't take place in a vacuum. It has a historical element to it that can be researched, as I mentioned, I think the last time that I preached about Lee Strobel, who was the investigative journalist and atheist, the legal editor for the Chicago Tribune, that he decided that he would investigate, do his own investigation, and he did this over the course of two years about the resurrection of Jesus. And he said he just saw this whole flood of evidence that pointed to that truth and became a believer and he wrote that book, The Case for Christ, which was turned into a movie. So we have these converging and convincing arguments. And I think in a skeptical age in which we live, 
that is important, and I always like to do this sometime during the octave of Easter, to talk about some of the things that shore up our faith, you know, that strengthen our faith, that our faith, again, it's not something that is a dream, it's not wishful thinking, but it's something that has emerged from a historical uh, realities. Uh, so here are some of the, in the couple of minutes that I have here, some of the reasons why we believe in the resurrection of our Lord. You know, imagine that Columbo or some detective came to a house and the man said, I know that John Jones stole my television because I was sound asleep when he stole it. Well, you probably wouldn't accept that testimony. Well, then how did you know if you were sound asleep? And of course, that was the argument in today's gospel that was circulating. His disciples stole the body while we were asleep. The testimony of women at that time was not accepted in first century Judaism. So why are women often the witnesses of the resurrection? Mary Magdalene called the disciple, the apostle of the apostles. She brings the message to the apostles. What possible motive could they have had for lying? Today you might sell some books, you might make some money if you tell a lie well enough. But what were the advantages that they had then for telling a lie? There were none. They were hated, scorned, persecuted, kicked out of the synagogue, imprisoned, tortured, exiled, boiled alive, roasted, beheaded, fed to lions. You know, hardly a catalog of perks. And if it were a lie, who would die for a lie? Chuck Colson tells the story of Watergate and how they were going to keep this all secret. Within two weeks, people were just confessing because they wanted to save their own skins. And there's no account of anyone saying, we made all this up. There may have been those who renounced their faith under threat of torture, but there was never anyone who said, okay, we just all made this up. We wanted to tell this story. There's no account ever. There are many witnesses. Two eyewitnesses wrote their own accounts to separate audiences, Matthew and John. And then Mark wrote down Peter's testimony and Luke tells us he interviewed the eyewitnesses. Paul had his own encounter. Now these are five separate witnesses, five separate books that have been compiled into one book, the Bible, but they're different witnesses. Paul speaks about 500 who witnessed the Lord's resurrection. <clears throat> we can also say that this faith grew despite the fact that it wasn't always a popular message. Renounce the world and its illegitimate pleasures. Change your life, lay down your life for others. Serve, love your enemies, pray for your persecutors. And yet the faith continued to grow. This morning's uh, opening prayer spoke about how the Lord continues to increase the number uh, of his church and prays specifically for those who enter the church this Easter vigil. Think about also the changed lives. People like St. Paul who wants to wipe out Christianity and becomes its great apostle. To our own day, watch the journey home and you'll see these people, have, their lives are changed when they came to know uh, the Lord. The holiness of lives. How can people like Mother Teresa, Pope John Paul II, how could they accomplish, Mother Angelic, how could she accomplish all of this without divine help? How could any of the saints, this luminous trail of the saints throughout history, how could they have accomplished what they did, living the holiness of their lives without divine help? The, the, the scriptures themselves are the most tested and proven books in all of history. And we have 500 copies before 500 AD, by far the largest number of uh, historical books before 500 AD. We can also talk about the sacraments that were being celebrated before the Bible was put together. And this became important, so important to the people that the martyrs in North Africa and Abitane said, uh, without the Lord, we cannot live. And so they gathered, even though the Roman emperor had outlawed 
the practice of the Christian faith, they continued to gather for the Mass because they didn't want to live without the Eucharist. And finally, our own encounter with the risen Lord. So this morning, we, this morning we have a holy communion with him. We hear his word and he speaks to us. The Mass throughout the ages has continued to bring about this encounter with the risen Lord who is in our midst, where we are gathered in his name, where we hear the gospel, his gospel proclaimed, and where we have a holy communion with him. So my brothers and sisters, what we believe is not some just wishful idea, some fairy tale that people would want to uh, just to comfort themselves with. No, it is something rooted in history, in archeology, span in all of this evidence, in these converging and convincing arguments that show that our faith is reasonable, reliable, and the Lord himself uh, reveals himself to us to confess faith in him. With confidence.